we'll start at 6.04 here. Um, thanks for everyone who jumped, who uh, was able to jump on tonight. And some of you guys are new to the mentor program. Some of you guys have been in it um, for this past year or, or two years ago. And I've done a couple of these Zoom sessions. Essentially, I ask a guest speaker tonight. Our guest speaker is Jordan Green from J and L Green Farm um, near Edinburgh, Virginia. And um, I usually ask them to do like a 10, 15 minute introduction on themselves. And then I open it up for everyone to ask questions. And when we have larger groups, I usually sell, tell them just to write it in the chat box, but we got a nice intimate small group tonight, which I love the smaller groups. So I'll let you guys, if you have questions, um, you can either send them to me and I can ask uh, via the chat box, which is kind of in the middle of your screen down below. Um, used to be, I guess it's still down there somewhere, or you can just ask. So um, the other thing I do ask is if you do have background noise going on behind you, go ahead and mute yourself um, until you are ready to speak. But again, I'm recording this. So if you guys want to re-listen to it at another later date, I will have that available for this group as well. And um, yeah, one more thing. I'm just going to do a quick plug real fast. This mentor group is um, funded through the VFGC, which is the Virginia Forage and Grassland Council. And that group um, has been really instrumental in me personally for my farming education and endeavors. And annually they have a forage conference during the month of January, this month uh, or next year in January. So this is the brochure um, and I will be sharing it on our Facebook post. It's at four different locations throughout the state of Virginia. Um, January 23rd, it's in Withville. January 24th, it's in Chatham. January 25th, it's in Warrington, and the 26th of January, it's in Weir's Cave. It's the same presentations every day, just four different locations, so people don't have to drive far to uh, to come to them. But it's a really great uh, networking and uh, connecting uh, conference where we have a couple of guest speakers. We have Jared Lumen, who is um, the host of the Herd Quitter podcast, which is a great podcast for anyone who likes to listen to podcasts. And he also does uh, grass fed beef up in Minnesota. We have Dr. Richard Watson, who's actually from New Zealand, but has been in the States for, I think, two decades now and is a grazing specialist. And Dr. Animal Portomingo, who is from Argentina. So we've got some um, some really great perspectives coming in this year. And it's a one day conference. If any of you want to go to this, just let me know. And the mentor program can take care of your fees to uh, to attend. It's I think it's $40, $50 for non-members. You guys are members since you're a part of the uh, mentor program. So just let me know. And um, I will be posting some stuff about the conference on Facebook. I actually did some interviews with some of these guys. So I'll be sharing that uh, soon as well. So I'll be at all four locations. Would love to see your smiling faces there and catch up and see how things are going. That's my only plug for the night. The rest of the time, I'm going to uh, let Jordan introduce himself. I've been following him for a couple of years now. I've actually heard of you quite some time ago, but I've been following you on your YouTube channel, which is called Farm Builder. And I've watched quite a few of your videos. Um, I was really into pasture pigs myself, and I've learned a lot from you based on your, your videos that you shared. Um, but would love just to give us as a group um, a good introduction into how you started into farming, what your farm currently looks like at this at this time, and then we'll open it up to to all of us to ask you some questions. So Jordan, take it away. All right, cool. Well, thanks for having me, Becky. And yeah, it's always uh, amazing who you meet over the the YouTubes and the socials. Um, so my name is, uh, like Becky said, Jordan Green. Uh, my wife and I own j &L Green Farm here in Edinburgh in Shenandoah County. Uh, we're first generation farmers and we've been full-time with this uh, this farm since 2009. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on myself, for five years before that, I was in the Marine Corps. And then uh, prior to that, I did a one-year apprenticeship at Polyface with Joel Salton, who you may you know, probably have heard of. Um, that was back in the day of, of 2001, so practically the Stone Ages. Um, it's amazing how 20 years goes. And uh, so, you know, before that, I was a kid, you know, just working on some local farms, you know, chucking hay, working in poultry houses, kind of just the, uh, 
you know, that typical teenage grunt labor force. Um, so kind of getting back to our operation now, um, when I got out of the Marine Corps and we came back in 09, um, we started a direct to retail livestock farm. So we don't do any produce here, um, but we are producing currently um, grass fed and finished beef. Uh, pastured pigs is our centerpiece enterprise. So we do farrow to finish on that. And we also sell a lot of piglets uh, pretty much nationwide now. They, they kind of go all over the place. Um, and what we've developed over the last 10 plus years is a closed herd of Duroc Hampshire genetics that we've really adapted for pasture and forest production, um, particularly here in Virginia. So, you know, pigs that can be outside year round, um, feral with minimal assistance um, outdoors year round. And you know, we use shelters and things like that, that we can definitely go into details if you guys would like. Um, and then pastured poultry is our, is our other thing right now that we do, uh, broiler chickens and turkeys. And that is obviously a more seasonal thing that we're doing that from March through September. So right now, uh, the things that are going on in the farm is going to be the pig operation and beef chicken is done for the year. Turkey's done. No one wants to buy a turkey right now. It's hard to give them away here in the uh, week or two after Thanksgiving, um, so yeah, just some more kind of details about um, about what we what we do and kind of the size of everything. Um, we're currently managing about 500 acres between owned and leased property. Um, we operated as a you know let's say a landless farm for the first 11 years that we were in business that we did not own any of the property that we were operating on. And kind of some of the, the business reasons for that was keeping capital uh, fluid so that we could move it through the, the operation itself and rotate capital and capture profitability um, as opposed to locking it up into a piece of ground. We were able to buy our first farm in, uh, <laughs> of all times, June of 2020. So, you know, like right when it was all hitting the fan. Um, we actually looked at the property first in February, which was before everything kind of went crazy. And then, you know, everything shut down as we were like doing all of the, um, the processes to actually buy it. So we ended up never meeting the seller, never met the seller's realtor. You know, it was like this whole virtual process of, uh, buying a farm. Uh, but it actually did work out fairly advantageously that we kind of beat that huge real estate bump that came the next year, uh, you know, as everyone um, decided they, they were going to leave the cities and move out to the country. So that for us is a 167 acre property that is all woods. Um, and that's where we operate a gestating and farrowing enterprise for the pigs. So if you were to see a picture of it, you would probably think it was a piece of hunting ground and not the kind of traditional farm, you know, that, that you would imagine. Um, and so that's the first place that we bought. Everything else is a variety of leased acreages, whether it be a handshake deal to more of a contractually, you know, drawn up and um, legalized type of type of lease. So I'm more than happy to you know spend a lot of time with you guys, uh, answer whatever kind of questions you have about what we do and and how we do it. And um, yeah, I would just open it up for for questions and discussions. That's kind of the the quick and dirty on what we do. Hey, Sem Semperfy. Ah, rah. Th th <laughs> thank you for your service. Uh, thank you. Tw tw 24 years myself in the Marine Corps. Oh, God bless you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you, uh, you got 167 acres of forest that you, you know, is kind of your, your primary, uh, farrowing and, and, and pig operation um two questions first one what's your containment uh protocol in terms of fencing and then the second one is is it a mix of hardwoods or is it more like you know lava like pine kind of stuff uh, in that uh, in, right you know, acreage cover yeah yeah that's, that's a great question uh, for us that property is still a satellite location it's not our hub farm um, cause there's no power, there's no house there. There's no utilities. 
Um, there's no water. It is just a raw piece of land. And the way that we developed it was we didn't want to have to spend a lot of money on that infrastructure. So some key things that we were looking for um, that led to us buying that particular piece of property is uh, it had water high on the property. So it had a spring coming out of the side of the mountain. It's basically up on the, the eastern mountain range if you're going up uh, 81, kind of right in the Mount Jackson area. And so it had a, a spring source pretty high that we were able to develop into a small pond for a gravity fed water system on the property. Um, for fencing, you know, we've done a lot of fencing on other properties that we've had. And the usual issue when you're trying to put a field fence line through the woods is if you cut a 20 foot wide hole, give it a few years and trees are gonna be coming down into that, uh, into that lane that you made through there and ripping the fence down and you know causing all kinds of issues. And that's aside from the fact of putting fence up the side of a mountain is not that grand. <laughs> so the idea that we came up with and actually worked out really well was we got a tractor trailer load of hog panels directly from the manufacturer out in Oklahoma. And we put up a fence uh, of just hog panels um, T posts at the intersection of each panel and then half inch rebar, you know, spaced in between the T posts. So every, every 16 feet is a T post and in between those is a piece of this rebar. And that is what's holding the, uh, the hog panel in place. And we just snake that along the property line. We're not super concerned about having it precisely on the property line. If it's inside on our side, that's a little, you know, a little bit, that's perfectly fine. If there's a big tree right in the property line, we just go around the tree to our side. The point is it's our containment fence um, of last resort. So for all of our sows, they are trained to electric fence. And that's what we're using to keep them uh, where they belong and in the paddock that we want them to be in. The hog panel fence is just kind of that last buffer, you know, should a deer rip the electric fence out or something like that. And the, uh, the souths are out taking a stroll around that hog panel fence is going to just, just keep them on the property till, you know, we're there at next feeding time. And the great thing about sows is, you know, they're, they're pretty much on the clock that, you know, they want to get fed at the set time every day and they will be at the feeders at the appointed time. So, uh, you know, when they do get out, it's not that big of a deal to, to get them back where they belong, but ended up running, uh, you know, again, this is 2020 prices when we bought all this stuff, but it ended up coming in at uh, just under $2 a foot to build to, for the material to buy that fence. Uh, and then obviously there was our time to put it in. So it's significantly less than the, uh, you know, like six to $8 that field fence is kind of coming in at right now. Yeah, plus you saved yourself a ton of money on clearing that 20-foot lane. Oh, yeah. Well, if you're going to do a field fence, it's got to be a 100-foot lane <laughs> because you, you don't want those trees coming down on the fence and, and ripping it all out. Hey, Jordan, Bill Rogers, I'll step in here. And yes, sir. I retired, I retired from the, uh, the Air Force in 2019. I don't want you and Carlton to make fun of me, though. Hey, I was in the air wing, so we were with the Air Force more than pretty much anybody else. So there, there you go. Hey, so. Chair Force. <laughs> <laughs> I figured I was going to take the shot. That's good. We got it out on the table. So I'm a, I'm a little north of you in uh, Strasburg, and, and I, I looked at your webpage. I, I want to look at the YouTube channel. I haven't got there yet, but uh, I, I wanted to shift just a little bit and talk to you about your poultry operation. So your your uh, your broilers. Do, do you affiliate with anybody? Or are you affiliated with like Pilgrims or? anything like that, or do you do those strictly on your own? And then I want to, if you have a minute, I'd like to come back and talk more about the turkeys. Yeah, yeah, sorry I didn't clarify that at first. Um, everything that we produce, we are retailing. So we, we're a direct-to-retail operation. Um, so all the all the livestock that we produce is getting slaughtered and sold under our label. So do you, do you use a, a local processing facility or you don't, you don't have your own processing facility that do, or do you do your own slaughtering? Yeah. For poultry, we have an exempted facility um, that allows us to do up to 20,000 birds a year. Okay. And then for anything that we ship out of state, we use a USDA facility um, down in Roanoke. Um, you may have heard it's uh, called eco, eco-friendly foods. They have a, a USDA plant. Great. 
and how, you know, not to give away your secret sauce, but how, how did you, can you kind of talk a little bit about how you develop those retail relationships to begin with and then how you nurture them? You know, if you right. stay with a certain client base or you tend to shift. Yeah. So, you know, the, the marketing and retail side is, is where the biggest challenge for any farm looking to kind of capture the retail dollar is going to be. Um, you know, all of us can figure out production pretty easy. There, you know, there's ways you can become more efficient for sure. But that uh, branding, marketing, and sales side is where a lot of just the, the groundwork uh, has to be done. There's really not a lot of shortcuts um, to jump in. And so for us, it's a continual uh, effort, and it has been for the last, you know, 14, 15 years. Um, the the kind of biggest, I guess, components of it are uh, differentiating yourself from other people that are in the space. And that's, it's actually becoming easier and easier now that um, several things are simultaneously happening, that the public is becoming a little more aware of, um, let's just say, the negative sides of, of the more commodified type of livestock production. And they're looking for these locally grown meats or stuff that's healthier or, you know, whatever, whatever reason they're coming to the table. Um, but what, what's also making, making it easier is a lot of the big retailers are moving further and further away from that human element in uh, their store or with their products. You know, like if you go to Walmart now uh, and you want to ask somebody about how to uh, do a pot roast, good luck. You're not getting that, that information there. You'll be lucky even to find a person there because it's all self-checkout now. And so there's a, there's a big opportunity right now for smaller producers who can have that human touch and have what we would call relationship marketing, where you're building a long-term and rewarding relationship with each customer that um, you know has this kind of mutual symbiosis to it that you you are providing a high quality product to them and also that kind of uh, uh, warranty or representation of quality that they can actually put a name and a face to and not just a self checkout stand um, you know if they have a question they can get a hold of you and ask it if they have a production question or even just a cooking question. Uh, that's a big part of what we do for marketing now is just education on how to cook the basic stuff. You know, things that that we would take 100% for granted, like how to cook a whole chicken. <laughs> yeah, it can be that simple that a lot of people have no idea because they're used to just getting a bag of nuggets and throwing them on a tray and you know throwing in the microwave or you know whatever uh, whatever they grew up doing. So. There's really no no shortcut to building that market. It's just doing the work and finding where that tribe of people who will support you are. And you know, for us, it started out the first uh, six years that we were um, running. We were doing five to six farmers markets every week, and you know, just getting our name out there and in front of as many people as we possibly could, and trying to find those folks who were looking for what we had and kind of. Uh, you know, vibed with us on on what we were doing. You know, once once that's kind of uh, at your capacity for what you can do, time and revenue wise, then then you start moving into all right. What's a more efficient way of marketing and selling the product? Where you know you're not spending that ten minutes with the customer in front of the freezer at the farmers market while they're trying to decide if it's sirloin tip night or rump roast night and you know they're just kind of going back and forth on that you can move that into instead of it being a one-to-one -one ratio of your time to their time it's now you have all that education on the website you know they can get a hold of you if you want over email but they can shop on their own time they can submit an order when they want to through a website so now instead of us burning that ratio of their time to our time Customers can now interface with us on the website 100% on their time. And the only thing that we have to do is fulfill the order when they actually submit it or, you know, answer their email or phone call if they want to call us up and have a question. So I guess what I was getting to is it depends on where your operation is at, you know, what your revenue, where your revenue is at, what kind of customer base you need uh, and where through that process of just getting your name out 
developing that you know core group of 50 customers and then moving it up to even more you know that that kind of process of maturing the the retail side of a farm that's great i, I really appreciate that insight you know hearing from your personal perspective so becky's going to give me the hook and say shut up and let somebody else talk she gets really mean <laughs> like that but um so just a, a one follow-up question, then I want to jump over to turkeys if everybody doesn't mind. But did, did you all develop your own website or did you you know contract with somebody locally to develop that for you? <clears throat> well, I mean, it's a lot easier now to do websites than it was in 2009, that's for sure. Um, what are you, are you guys producing meats or produce or a combination of both? Yeah, right now I've got sheep, goats, and a bunch of poultry. Uh, so it's, uh -huh. it's limited. I want to get in cattle eventually, but that's probably two years right. down the road right now. So there, there's a lot of turnkey uh, website builders now that are really awesome for startup farms. Um, you, there's companies like Grace Cart, um, Barn to Door is another one. Uh, a lot of farms are even using Shopify and you know or um, a Square website you know like the square stand that they have at a lot of stores you you can set that up so really you you don't need to hire a developer to build you a site if if you can navigate social media pretty well you can build your own uh, e-commerce site right now it's or or the people who are running those companies they will do that part for free if you're willing to pay the subscription to have the site that's great good yeah that's one of the Limb facts. One of the things I got to get to because I still have a day job, so that's always a challenge is finding the time. But um, so just uh, re real quick on your turkeys. So you you um you you pasture your turkeys, and um, so I I got about right now what I got about eight turkeys. Just I, I was playing with them this year to see what they're doing. They're huge. Mm -hmm. You know, let them run around. Uh, they're real right. good about you know going in their little coop at night. Um, what um just can you tell me do, do you just let your free range or do they come back to a coop are they out in the woods uh, you know i've seen some people that you know when they get in the advanced turkey they'll do the you know netting over them entirely to you know try and do their best to keep any predators away from them so just kind of right you might just give a little bit of overview of your turkey operation i'd appreciate it yeah so it, it really depends on what scale you're doing them you know if you're doing 50 or below turkeys you don't need to have an elaborate system then just running around on an acre or two is probably perfectly fine um you know for us it's it's a much bigger operation so there's a lot more kind of management steps in there and in how they're brooded and started and then run on pasture. But the process for us is they spend the first five weeks in a brooder. Then they will go out into the pasture in some type of shelter, uh, whether it be that kind of classic Salatin style shelter, you know, the 10 by 12, two foot high, you know, shelter that moves every day. Um, we also use bigger ones now that we're building uh, ourselves. It's not a commercially available one, but it's essentially a 24 by 20 um, type of shelter. So we'll put them in there, but some type of shelter for the next about four weeks, which will get them up to nine, you know, around nine weeks old. And then they will go out in the electrified nettings for the last six, seven, eight weeks, um, you know, depending on how heavy we're trying to, to grow them out. If you can get them to that nine, 10 week phase, most of your predator problems are, are not going to be an issue as far as aerial predation. Um, you still have the ground predator issues. And we've, we've found the easiest way to solve that is we have great Pyrenees that are just trained to be with birds. And so when the turkeys go in the netting, the dog goes right in with them. And he just camps out with them for, you know, two months. Awesome. Thanks very much. Becky yeah, was giving me that, that stink eye. She was like, shut up, Bill. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Jordan. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely, Bill. So tell, tell us about, about your cattle operation. Ah, okay. So how, how many of you guys are cattle guys? Okay. All right. All right. Uh, oh, man. I'm entering the hornet's nest here. Um, so have you heard, have you guys ever heard of an aged beef program? All right, so it's not aged beef as in like dry aged for 30 days or, you know, 500 days or, or anything like that. Um, it's an aged program as in it's old cows. 
and it's something not as popular here in the United States yet. Uh, in Europe, of course, it's you know it's a little bit more popular because they're very bougie about their food and all that. Um, but we what we are doing is instead of having a cow calf herd or buying stalkers and raising them out. Um, we are employing kind of that, uh, you guys are familiar with Bud Williams and kind of his school of thought on, um, you know, there's always an overvalued animal and an undervalued animal on the market. And kind of your job is to find which is which. And systemically, cull cows are the undervalued animal on the market because they have no value except a cargill. And they're just going to, you know, grind them up the next day. So we, you know, kind of did that traditional cow calf or buying in stockers every year you know, pretty much the same as, as anybody else. But what became apparent to us is the pasture we have is at a premium. So we're managing 500 acres, but we only have a little over a hundred of open pasture. The rest of it is woods, you know, with the pigs. Um, so every acre of grass mattered to us and we didn't want to burn acres of grass for a cow calf herd. And it basically made it inefficient for us to finish, uh, you know, animals that if we had a cow calf herd, when maintaining those stalker calves, you know, we might be finishing 20 or 30 head a year type of thing uh, instead of, you know, what we actually do. So we kind of looked around at what is the standard production protocol for a lot of grass fed and finished producers. They're buying in stalker calves from other farms if they're not doing it themselves and they're running them out for a year to 18 months. So we took that management, uh, you know, let's say protocol or norm for what's done with a lot of, of grass fed producers. It's said, we're going to try that with cull cows instead of stalker, you know, steers and heifers. And so that's what we've been doing for the last six or seven years now is every year we buy in a herd of pound cows or cull cows, depending on which stockyard you go to. It's kind of a specific type of animal that we're looking for. Um, did any of you guys go to Winchester? So, yeah, about 20% of, of what comes through the pound sale there are cows that are still perfectly serviceable. And, you know, they, they, they just, uh, someone had to pay their tax bill or something, and they're just taking the sale and getting rid of them. Uh, and so that's what we're looking for is this uh, cow that's either coming, you know, it's kind of that misfit one, um, was bred out of season, open, cold for some reason, but she still has gas in the tank. And we're building up a herd of those uh, every year, grazing them for a year, and then we're slaughtering them. So we're, we are into that. Everything is over 30 months. We can't do T-bone or porterhouse, you know, so uh, it does kind of limit us on the, the type of cuts that we can market, but for the, the market that we have and kind of our customer base, we need an additional two cows just as roast and ground for every one that we sell as steak. So steak is not our, our big thing. We're more of the meat and potatoes of ground beef, uh, chuck roasts, you know, sirloin tip, kind of those, those family cuts and not the 4th of July steak cuts. So doing this old cow program uh, has actually worked really well that we're able to, to capture the most undervalued animal on the market uh, on average, put 300 pounds of gain on them in a year. 45% uh, of them will calve while they're here. So that's just an additional kind of bonus on top that we're going to have this random crop of calves that we can wean off and sell. And, um, you know, turning out some pretty, pretty high quality carcasses for old cows. Um, so we work closely with our processor on kind of that carcass evaluation that, you know, once they're dead and hanging in the cooler, that's when we'll look at the carcasses and, you know, not have an official grading on it, but just kind of a spot grade that, hey, is this good enough to cut steak out of? If it is, we will. If not, it's all going into roasting ground. I, I told you, cow guys, I would... I'd curl your ears back a little bit. <laughs> so, Jordan Earl Ingersoll, how you doing? Yeah, how's it going, man? Good, man. Hey, your I want to let you know we finished uh, processing all of our hogs in uh, November. We got hogs from Jordan this year, piglets, and they all they all worked out great. We had right. the date September, October, November, and you know we appreciate the fact that you take, you know, the care you take and want to want to provide such a, you know. A good animal so right, awesome glad they worked out well for you guys they worked out well we'll be calling you again i hadn't called you yet i hope you still have 
uh, <laughs> only spots are available because we we just need to run some numbers, you know, to see what we're going to do this year. So, uh, on your on those uh, cold cows, you don't you don't go ahead and finish the calves out that you get from them. Also, you go ahead and take them to the sale barn. Is that your norm for that? Yeah, for us, it's just easier to send them back through the sale barn. Um, that we're really not set up to wean calves very well or handle a stalker herd. Um, one of our rental farms, the fencing is pretty sketchy. And, you know, old cows are a lot easier to keep contained with some electric fence than a bunch of 600-pound heifers and steers. So it's more of just kind of the looking at the infrastructure we have and what works for our system. It was like calves are a little bit of a hassle. So we'll just cycle them back through. And how about because they're coming from the sale barn and you don't really know what you're getting, any, uh, you know, disease-related or other problems, or are you just really, really picky and when you're selecting stuff at the sale barn? Well, about 50% of, of what we're buying is actually coming straight from producers now, that, that we're circumventing the sale barn route and working here locally directly with cow-calf guys. Because uh, you go in and say, hey, you know, when you when you round up the herd in the fall and you do your weaning and you sort through whatever cows you're going to get rid of, give me a call and let me look at them. And I'm happy to pay, you know, five, 10 percent over the market for your good condition call ones. And uh, you can bring them right over and just drop them off in our, you know, our area that we receive cattle in. And so that kind of sweetens the pot for them a little bit that they know um, they know what they can get if they call me. And uh, so about 50% are coming that way. The others we are buying from the stock sale. And yeah, it's, you know, it's something that you learn a little bit every year on. You know, I still have a couple of them die, you know, in the month or two after they get here. So just trying to improve on that. But we do have a protocol of when we buy them, they're going into like an isolated area for a period of time. Um, we do worm them at the stock sale before we bring them home. So we're trying to, you know, keep, and prevent any of that stuff from happening. But um, yeah, I would say it's it's something that's just what's your comfort level. You know, a lot of cattle go through stock sales and do perfectly fine. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there could be those one or two in there that are going to be an issue. I'll change subjects a little bit and go over to, well, I guess somewhat the hogs and the cattle. But you're, you're still got a fair amount of acreage on your farms that you've converted from wood to silver pasture, is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're just starting to do, you know, a lot of that. And of course, the powers that be where you do research on and stuff will tell you, you know, it's, you can't do it well, you can't do it good in hardwoods. I know that's not true because I've seen what you do, what Greg Judy has done and others. So can you give me to help just a quick, you know, if I have a, section of hardwoods that I'm I'm trying to convert and it's it's hardwoods that have been cut you know years ago probably 30 40 years 50 years maybe so you know it's got stuff that has come back up but you know a lot of the you know three trees or whatnot from one type of right. stuff and that sort of thing but you know it's right. it's, uh, it's you know it's something we really want to take advantage of because we have the acreage that's not being used yeah yeah well <clears throat> you know, the key thing with with livestock under any type of significant canopy is you have to manage the uh, the duration of the impact. And, and you also know the species of trees that you're working with, like red oaks. They, they do not do well if they have pigs around them all the time. Um, they're they're going to check out in the first couple of years. But if it's you're bringing a group of pigs through for one week twice a year, so it's a very, you know, there's a lot of recovery time between each rotation. Um, the trees are going to do a lot better, um, you know, particularly oaks. Uh, red oaks in particular are, are probably the most fickle about having pigs around them. Um, other hardwoods, I've seen zero issues with pigs being around and having tree mortality. Uh, pretty much any hickory tree, not a problem uh, to have pigs around them. Um, I guess you wouldn't really call black walnut a hardwood necessarily, but black walnuts do very well with, with pigs around them. But other trees, uh, you know, that the pigs like to give extra attention to are going to struggle. You know, any type of fruity tree. So like cherry trees, pigs are going to pretty much eradicate them in a couple of years because they, they're very tasty. 
Um, and, you know, transitioning it to, to silvo pasture, you know, it's coming down to what are you trying to preserve? If you're trying to preserve a, a high quality timber stand, then yeah, you probably don't want to have a, an integrated livestock grazing system underneath them. But if you are trying to have a, uh, a shaded pasture that allows for lower animal stress, um, you know, a level of multi-speciation going on, and then at some point, what, as the trees die and you're replacing them, they're going for firewood or, you know, kind of lower grade type of timber, or you got a sawmill on your own place and you're milling them up and you don't care if you have a red oak that has a stain running through the, the trunk, then there's no problem at all to do it. So it, it's kind of balancing all of those various factors to what, what do you want to prioritize? The, the numbers that were kind of, you know, very black and white for me is if you look at what a landowner can get once every 50 years on an average stand of, of grow back timber. So it's not something that's planted or trimmed or, you know, highly maintained. Yeah. You know, you're looking at under a thousand dollars an acre that you're going to get for logging it off uh, unless you have some real high value timber. And if you're running a, uh, you know, an integrated um, livestock grazing program on those same acreages, you're going to make a lot more over those 50 years doing livestock than you ever would with the trees. So um, having trees there as a silvo pasture and managing them well and having that potential timber harvest or firewood harvest is really just kind of the, the bonus on top and not having to pull shade structures everywhere is also really nice as well. Any, any references that come to mind that we can research that would help or, um, yeah, so I forget the name of the, the book. Um, it was written back in the 19, like 20s or 30s, and it's on tree. It might be called Tree Crops, um, but uh, it, it's really cool that at the, the time, these guys were really advocating for uh, an, a national agricultural system of, uh, of tree management and harvesting tree crops and using them for different things and managing animals underneath it. And to me, it was cool to read that because the, the more, you know, we're not really inventing a whole lot of new concepts here. What we have now is new technologies to do old ideas with, you know, like grazing pigs on oak and hickory nuts is not a new invention. They, you know, you, you read uh, books like Lesser Beasts, which is about pigs and the great Appalachian hog drives and how you know, millions of pigs were produced in the Appalachian region and grazed on the mountains and then herded down to the Carolinas, almost like driving cattle. Um, what's changed now is we have the technology to actually manage those animals on smaller areas. So you, you don't need to have, uh, you know, 10 farm hands that are out with the 3,000 head herd of pigs up in the mountain all summer type of thing. Um, so th there's a lot of cool ideas that are old that definitely died off and went away, but now can be almost rediscovered in this, this new technology that we have now with electric fences and solar panels and water systems can be brought into the equation of, oh, we actually can low impact manage uh, you know, animals on the side of a mountain and not have any infrastructure at all. I'll shut up now. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks for everything. Everything. Yeah, good to see you again, Hero. Yeah, you too. Hey, Jared, can you talk about your uh, stocking density uh, in your silva pasture? Yeah, sure. So with with pigs, stocking density. So let me let me back up here uh, a little bit. Stocking density as like a, a tool for assessing a land potential or yield potential really only matters with grazing animals. You know, if you're doing goats, sheep, or cattle, that's really only where you need to know what the stocking rate or stocking density would be. If you're looking at poultry or pigs, you can cheat those numbers as much as you want because you're just feeding them extra feed. You know, if the, the stocking density and rate of a poultry house is, uh, you know, mind-numbing how many they have per acre in there. Um, but when we're looking at poultry and swine on ground, the stocking rate and density has to be more a reflection of the disturbance factor that they're bringing to that acreage 
and also the manure load. That, that's really the big one is, hey, we can throw 500 pigs on one acre, but they're going to completely destroy it in a day or two. And they're going to put down a huge amount of manure that's going to be running down the river. And, uh, you know, the river keepers are going to be at my door tomorrow. So, um, you know, for us with pigs, what we found to be a good balance of that uh, stocking rate and just in case I'm on a different wavelength from you guys on what the two are, um, you know, stocking rate is how many animals per acre and density is how tightly they're grouped together, you know, in, in the paddock for a specific period of time. So with our big sows, which are seven, 800 pound animals, they're basically small cows. Uh, we're running them at a stocking rate of one to two per acre. Now the density of them will be, uh, we run our sows in sets of 14 to 16 head, um, and they're gonna occupy about a 12 acre range, um, you know, for, uh, for a year. So they're gonna move every week to a new paddock that's about half to two thirds of an acre in size. It kind of depends on the terrain and all that. What that does is it gives us a one acre, or I'm uh, sorry, a one week stay in any particular paddock two to three times per year. So we have a long recovery period between each cycle that those animals are, are rotating around that particular range. So that kind of limits their disturbance to a level that's acceptable for um, you know, the, the kind of disturbance factor that we're looking for. Uh, and also keeps that manure load in a range that's, that's kind of acceptable. So for pigs, that's what we do it. Um, for sil you know, with the silo pasture, I think that's where your, your question was. We're just bringing the cattle through at the, the, the kind of periodic intervals that the, the forage needs to be harvested. So sometimes we'll skip through the silo pasture part of the farm and just move them from one field into the other. And other times we'll stop and hold them there in the silvo pasture. Um, I like to hold the silvo pasture specifically for the, kind of that late summer when it gets really hot. Um, it's nice in August to have the cow herd under the shade instead of out in the field and, and wilting. Yeah, that was exactly the uh, info I was looking for. Thanks very much. All right, cool, sweet. If there's that uncomfortable <laughs> silence, I'm going to jump back in real quick. So just a, a couple follow-up questions on, on your, do, do you find since you're, you're not selling T-bones um, you know, if you're selling your kind of your second cuts, are those customers buying other of your products, your poultry, or are they, you know, just interested in ground and, you know, they kind of consistently come back to you for ground. I'm, you know, thinking about the multi-marketing aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, there, there's probably a small handful full who are only buying one species from us. You know, they're, they're only buying beef or they're only buying poultry uh, or pork. That's kind of more of a wholesale type of thing that we definitely have wholesale customers that all they want is pork or all they are here for is poultry. For those one, you know, those individual retail customers, the, the work of branding and marketing and acquiring them um, is where, you know, 80, 90% of the work is. Once you have them in the door, it's a lot easier to fill that cart up that, all right, well, you know, we've got beef here, we've got poultry, we've got turkey, and then we carry other stuff from other producers. So we have, um, you know, eggs, cheese, honey. Um, a lot of the, the people in my family are gluten intolerant, so we carry a whole line of gluten-free breads, which has been very popular with our customer. Uh, so the more you can diversify the products that you're selling, certainly the higher revenue per customer uh, on an annual basis you will have. The, the trap, though, that a lot of producers fall into is they think that they have to produce all of those different things. And, and honestly, today, most customers are not as concerned who's producing it, but that the quality is there. And you know, if, if you've done the work of saying, hey, this is another local producer that's doing honey, you know, they have their beehives right down the road, or these are eggs coming from uh, you know, this Mennonite outfit that we've vetted their production protocols and, and they're good to go. 
that's what people are looking for more than a farm where, hey, you guys produce everything that you sell, you know, type of type of scenario. So people are looking for that quality. They're looking for that assurance and representation of quality and that just kind of connection that we have with relationship marketing where there's someone who actually knows their name that will pick up the phone if they call or answer their email and um, not try to, you know, sell them junk, basically. Great. Thank you. And then, uh, so unrelated, but but related in, in all the initiatives that, that you undertook, you know, from when you started the farm, did, did you work with NRCS or soil and water or anything, or did you fund everything yourself? Um, well, those are, those are kind of two different questions because funding is not, not all funding is governmental funding. Um, so no, we have not had a whole lot of interaction with NRCS or, you know, kind of the USDA side of, of what we do. Um, for a lot of the production practices that we use, you're you're so far outside of the norm of, of what they kind of work with um, that, you know, for some people, I suppose it's worth the effort. For us, we did not. Um, now, the first time that we did use the USDA is when we bought this acreage in 2020 that we dual financed that with FSA and farm credit just because they offer fantastic rates. Um, you know, it was, it was kind of a, a no brainer that, Hey, we're going to definitely work with them on buying a piece of property. So that was kind of our first at interaction with FSA um, was 11 years into the operation. Um, now, as far as financing goes, yeah, we've worked with all types of financing with private financing with, um, you know, more commercial capital. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a uh, hundred different ways you can go with that for sure. Do you uh, do you have employees other than yourself and your wife? Yeah, it, it really depends on the time of year. Right now, um, we have six part-time people in the summer. That bumps up to more because we're in our, our poultry season. So it kind of ebbs and flows. Employment is honestly, uh, or staffing, let's say, that's been our biggest issue for the last four years, is finding um, competent staff, that doesn't mind working outside when it's cold and getting rained on every now and then. And, uh, you know, what we view as our competitor for uh, labor is the trades. You know, that, that's who we're competing with. We're not competing with, uh, you know, Walmart and Sheets necessarily for employees. We are competing with construction, um, you know, and, and landscape companies and kind of the, the more trade oriented employers is who we have to compete with for staff. So yeah, it's, it's something that's kind of a, a continual uh, situation that you're dealing with is trying to onboard competent staff and manage them and, and uh, keep them, keep them on the farm. But typically we have anywhere from five to nine employees, depending on what's going on. So these are great questions, by the way. You guys, uh, so do, you guys do are you good. Have, you have a uh, you have a store at your at your farm, or is most of your revenue from uh, from retail sources hmm. off the farm? Right. No, that's that's a great question. Um, so it's kind of yes to all the above. Uh, our our philosophy on sales is everything is for sale. At, at the right price, kind of going back to that, that Bud Williams thing. Um, so, you know, if we take pigs, for example, by working through the process of cost analysis and all that, we know um, where the price needs to be for every stage of that pig's life. So we sell a lot of piglets to other farms. We sell more piglets than we finish ourselves uh, because farrowing is not that easy of a thing to do. And a lot of other farms don't want to have to deal with it. So we sell a lot of piglets. We have a price for that that is profitable for us. We sell finished uh, feeder pigs. So, you know, 280 to 320 pounds that they can buy at live weight. We sell rail weight finished carcasses to other producers. Um, and then, you know, obviously we sell whole, whole hogs all the way down to, you know, half a pound of bacon if you want. So, you know, it's establishing a profitable sales point for, that particular species across a 
a wide possibilities of the, the way I like to say it is across a wide range of configurations, you know, kind of back to my air wing days. And Bill would know that about how you configure the aircraft. Um, now, as far as venues, the, the more diversity you can have there, the better as well. That, you know, if you had all of your eggs, let's say in a farmer's market uh, avenue of, of retailing, well, COVID was going to destroy you because they shut everything down. So we like to have diversity there as well. So, yeah, we do have an on-farm store. It's actually more of an order fulfillment center than it is a store. We're only open for three hours a week on a Saturday. So it's maybe 5% of our revenue is people walking through the store here. Um, what has worked really well for us is having a e-commerce facilitated locally delivered model into Northern Virginia, DC, Tidewater, Richmond type of areas. So they're ordering through our website, basically like you would on Amazon, and it's being delivered to a central drop point in their area at a set day and time every month. Um, so you may have heard it called a buying club model. We call them drop sites. Everybody likes to have their own unique kind of kind of flavor on it. But it's, you know, everybody in XYZ neighborhood in Arlington who doesn't, they, they don't want to drive out here. We're two hours from Arlington. Uh, but they'll order every four weeks. And sidebar, a lot of them have moved into a subscription model where it's just a subscription order that automatically renews every four weeks. And they know, hey, we meet up at the Smith's house on Tuesday evenings at seven. And, you know, that's where they'll pick up their order. Uh, and then the third leg for direct to retail sales would be nationwide shipping. You know, that we will we ship meat anywhere in the country. And the beauty about some of these newer websites, this was where it will all tie in. Uh, we use Grace Cart specifically. We don't have to do the work of figuring out um, what shipping needs to be on top of the product. We can set a pricing schedule that based on the zip code of the customer shows them what the price is. So, you know, like on farm, let's say bacon is $8 a pound. If you're shopping on our website, you have to create an account before you can view any prices and your zip code is San Diego, California. Well, that bacon is $25 a pound for you with free shipping because we can build that shipping into the cost um, you know, that they'll see for the product itself. Um, so kind of lends back out uh, a little bit. I would, you know, without having the numbers in front of me for, for our revenue, direct to retail sales is probably 50% of what we do. Um, wholesaling to other distributors, which would be like most of them are in state is probably 20, 25% of what we do. And the balance uh, is made up with live animal sales, which is going to be piglets or finished hogs primarily. I hope sounds that answered like, your question. Sounds like, sounds like to me you've got an administrative nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's it's not as complicated as as it sounded there, but it's probably a function of we've done it for a while, so it's very streamlined at this point. That you know we have Excel charts that all we have to do is just input, hey, what are feed costs right now? What are land costs? What is labor cost? And it will calculate. All right, this is what we need to charge for a piglet. Um, you know, and we can kind of work that all the way through to the to the retail cuts. So, yeah, if we were to try to create everything from scratch right now, yeah, that's going to be a monumental task. But when we've been doing it um, for for as long as we have, it's just a, a systematic process of building one stage on top of the other. So are you are you, uh, are, you or are you contemplating trying to uh reproduce your systems uh for other farmers and 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 sell your systems um well yeah i don't think there's anything on the let, let's say on the sales side that is extremely unique to us you know a lot of direct to retail farms have e-commerce sites they have on farm stores they deliver they ship there, there's really no magic in a bottle there um, what I would say is, is more proprietary to us that we've developed is the hog management system that, you know, developing a, 
uh, a protocol for managing hogs on pasture that's relatively low cost. So, you know, if you look at kind of your, what I always look at is your cost per spot. So if you, there's not a lot of hog farms left in Virginia still, it's, it's more of a Midwest type of thing now, but their cost to build, um, let's say a gestating and farrowing facility is two to $3,000 per head. You know, to build that barn, that's your cost per slot. Um, for feeder to finish, it's like maybe six to $800 per spot. Well, we've developed a protocol where instead of that $3,000 per sow slot, we're at 50. And so that's really what gives us a competitive edge is we've, we've kind of taken that $4 million building out of the equation and be like, you know, we don't need a $4 million building to run two, 300 sows on the farm and make a good income from doing pigs. And that was a little bit of kind of reinventing the wheel and figuring out what were some of the, the lost art, the, the lost art and science from these old uh, pig guys who are, are pretty much all gone by now who were doing pigs back in the 1900s, 1920s. They didn't have any of that stuff either. And somehow they figured it out. And, uh, you know, there was a reason that pigs were called the mortgage lifter at some point, you know, they did actually generate a good revenue and income for a farm. We just needed to figure out kind of where was that lost and, and re redevelop a protocol to kind of bring that back to reality. Sounds like you've done a good job. Congratulations. Well, we're we're doing something. So <laughs> some days I question my sanity, but yeah. Uh, hear you. Hey, Jordan. Uh, thanks for taking some time to uh, speak with us tonight. Uh, Definitely. I was curious. Uh, so with uh, current technology, and as you're as some of us are stepping into this cattle uh, industry, I work with uh, Andy. I'm a stepson, by the way, and uh, I bought some some of Earl's pigs, which seems like he's buying from you now. So I'll be reaching out to you in the near future, probably, if I decide to get back into him. We'll see who gets to me first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, with technology and everything, it seems like e-commerce is something you want to be forward leaning on. But at the same time, well, would you have any recommendations on uh, building a foundational uh, local I guess market or whatever before you reached into that and started looking at larger shipping operations and the cost that might come with that kind of thing. Right. It seems like something you want to be very aggressive with, but at the same time, it's very daunting to think about. And I don't know, you know, what what financial burdens comes with that e-commerce kind of. Right. Uh, it's really not. It's not a huge overhead to uh, to ship. And when I. There is a split there. E-commerce does not mean you're shipping. It just means that all of your sales are facilitated through a website. So people can walk into the farm store and never look at the website and buy something. But uh, COVID really changed a lot of that, that we still have a significant number of curbside order, you know, curbside orders where they order it online and they want to pick it up in a cooler on the porch of the store. Uh, which you know is, is easy enough to do. So once we have generated the account for that customer in our in our system, that's really the, the key piece of information that you want in the way that the market works now is you want that verified authentic contact to that person. Most people are you know before most people now before they ever go to a store, or look at a new company, they're going to check them out digitally. You know, they're, they're going to Google you. They're going to see if you got social media. They're, they're going to kind of do their own investigation first. So even for local sales, that principle still is true, that people are going to look you up online and see what you're all about. And if as a farm, you don't have a website, uh, for a lot of people, that's immediately a red flag. It's like, all right, what kind of operation is this? They don't even have a website. It's basically the, the, a website is the yellow pages of today. You know, you're not even, without a website, you're not even in the phone book. So um, <laughs> you, you, even if you're wanting to start something real local to you, you still can do, uh, you know, essentially an e-commerce type site where people can see the products, they can shop them. And you could just say, hey, on-farm pickup only or curbside at the farm only or, you know, pick up at the farmer's market only. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for the time. Yeah. Yeah.
Uh, by the way, for you uh, Marines and Air Force guys, Stephen, my son-in-law is a 23-year uh, uh, graduate of the Coast Guard. Hey, they're they're legit. I got a lot of respect for the Coast Guard. Hey, Coasties, Coasties, yeah, it's like a mini Navy. <laughs> Puddle Pirates on deck. <laughs> they always have the nice stuff too. So yeah, that's right, that's right. Hey, Jared, real quick. Um, so you made a couple of references tonight about um, so not, not really like relearning, but but the tapping into to knowledge of old, right? And mm -hmm. so I found the same uh thing to be true that we we once upon a time where we were really knowledgeable about how to finish cattle for example on virginia ryegrass right and there's right. books that, that really talk about you know how to do that and things you mentioned tree crops um as, as sort of a reference on silva pasture and pigs um, mm -hmm. would you would you be willing to share with becky so she can you know get it to the rest of us um sort of your Wikipedia list of references on, you know, sort of how we used to do things that, you know, it's written down because sometimes mm. those things are hard to find with Google. Uh, right. Somebody like you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'd be happy to do that. I would say it's not a real extensive list and a lot of it, you just kind of pick up here and there. Um, yeah. It's, it's really cool if you can get your hands on like the old USDA yearbooks that they would put out where they'd have all kinds of neat stuff in there on, um, you know, how to do poultry or pigs or cattle. Uh, you know, if you can get ones that are like pre-1950s, uh, they, they tend to have a lot of that old animal husbandry type of type of knowledge in there. Uh, but it, it's also, it, it, it is taking what that uh, information might be, but then putting it through a filter of what we know now. Like we know a lot more about genetics now than you know, was, was known then. We know a lot more about feed values and, you know, feed formulations and, and things like that. So it's really looking for what are the nuggets there? How can we put that into what, you know, how can we filter it through what we know now? And also the, the kind of technological practices that we can have now to develop a, a, essentially a new, a new package, a new system. Super. Thank you. Well, it's 7.06, and I do want to be respectful of Jordan's time, but maybe just one more question before we kind of wrap things up tonight from anyone who might have one last burning question for Jordan here. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. Bring it on, guys. <laughs> I'm surprised I've not heard any crayon jokes yet from the from the Air Force and the Puddle Pirates. <laughs> I, I I have a question. Yeah. Um, so, all right. So, how many cattle did you say you had? How many cows? So you you rotate them. We finish sixty to seventy a year. Okay, and you said that you had like a hundred acres. Yeah, about a hundred acres of grass. Mm -hmm. Do you rotate them during the winter? Um, so right now we're still grazing, so they are rotating. Um, mm -hmm. Once we are out of pasture, we typically will park them in a spot for a winter. Usually, that's oriented to where we can get water to, because we don't have a buried water system on on the farm. It's an above ground system, so mm -hmm. you know for a some winters it's been like 15 days and other winters it's been 90 days that, that we can't use the water system. And we got to keep the cow herd somewhere that they can get water. And so that's where we'll feed hay. Okay. I'm kind of, I'm still new to this. Like May was just a year that I've had a few cows. I only nice. have five and I have 10 acres and right. I'm rotating them. Last, last year I only had about four and a half acres of fenced in so i just got the rest fence in last february right. so they went around the field a couple of times but it's been hayed for years so it really okay. needs help you know right but um yeah i'm going i'm kind of going around now again thinking mm, it's kind of slim pickings so right yeah kind of the the key thing would be is 
when you when you park a cow herd for the winter, you know, it's called a sacrificial paddock for a reason. They, mm-hmm. they are going to tear that spot up. Mm-hmm. And so especially the winters that we've been having, say, the last five years here in Virginia, the ground doesn't freeze for any significant period of time. So you're mm-hmm. going to have a lot of pasture pugging and other things going on if you keep the herd moving. Um, so you almost do want to pause them in one spot for the winter, feed hay there, let the pasture come back in the spring before you start rotating again. So you're not having that real heavy disturbance and, and destruction to all of your pastures as a specific spot. Mm-hmm. And it, you know, if you have low fertility, just change where that spot is every year because that's where you'll feed the hay, the waste hay is tramped into the ground, the excess manure is put into the ground. You can kind of jumpstart the fertility cycle for that spot and then just do it in a different spot the next winter and you can kind of get that fertility regoing on your 10 acres. Okay, thank you. Nice. Yeah, cool. Jordan, can you talk a little bit more about uh, how you feed hay? I know there's a lot of different ways with unrolling or a round ring, or if you don't have a tractor, maybe having bales set out and putting a fence around it so you can bale graze it throughout the the winter. Can you just go over mm-hmm. a little more of that of what you're currently doing? Yeah. So uh, for us, we unroll everything. Um, you know, most of the farm is fairly uh, hilly. So for us, it's easy enough. You just make sure the round bale is oriented the right way on the tractor and go to the top of the hill, cut the netting off and let her rip. Um, I did a little experiment last winter where we fed a hay in round rings in a spot and then we unrolled it in another spot and then just gauge the impact that those places had during the winter into the spring and even into the summer and feeding in rings on pasture you know again virginia winters are now an extended mud season it's not freezing solid um feeding in those rings had noticeable effects on the ground and the forage well into the summer so it's a very long-term impact having the hay ring whereas the areas where we unrolled by may they're you know they had completely recovered from from that disturbance and you know you always get that real lush growth where every roll kind of unrolled because you get that extra organic matter going there so it it does come back to that trade-off of do you want to sacrifice some hay by unrolling because they are going to trample some and waste some or do you want to sacrifice uh pasture potential into the next year by doing rings and to me it seems like if you're going to do rings do them either in a barn or in a very confined area where it's going to minimize that that impact on the pasture um, into the next year. So, so for us, we unroll everything is the the short and sweet of it. So, so Jared, did did you move the rings around the paddock that you were combining them in, or was it always in the same place? You just kept refilling the ring. Um, for the for the test I was doing, they were in one spot for let's say two weeks. But if yeah. you have particularly wet weather, the the pugging and uh, and compaction effect on the ground happens in the first day, and it just gets worse the longer that you, that you keep it there. Was this field that you were doing the round rings in? Was it had it already been grazed down, or was there still some decent stockpile there when you put the round rings in place? Or do you remember? Uh, it, this was January, so it pretty much had been grazed down, and they they were on hay full time. So it was either being unrolled there or put in a ring. One more question for me: um, I'm a soil health is a big a little bit of a geek here on the soil health thing. But is there mm-hmm. are there any um, ways that you measure or gauge your soil health, like if it's improving? Or, you know, do you watch your forage production or, um, yeah, or your stocking rate per, right. per year? Like, are there anything, anything in particular that you, you look at throughout the year that you're like, okay, soil health is doing good or it's improving? Right. Um, kind of what is unique for us is that we are grazing pigs on almost all the pasture as well, which is a, a next element of, of disturbance, let's say. <laughs> when you're running groups of feeder pigs that are 50 to 100 head on a pasture as well, and they're getting moved every four to seven days, you know, depending on some factors. Uh, probably the tool 
that we use the most to gauge soil and forage health is going to be weed load. Because when you're, when you're working with pigs, you know, they're obviously putting down a lot of nitrogen, a lot of phosphorus. And so you, you can use what your weed load is as your, as your gauge for if there needs to be less pigs basically going on, or if you have it dialed in. Um, we do a lot of overseeding with high value uh, annuals with the pigs. So when they're on pasture, you know, this time of year, we're seeding in kind of those cover crop type of things like barley you know, rye, stuff like that. Uh, but in the spring into the early summer, we're using either pearl millet or forage sorghum. And the, the combination of pearl millet and forage sorghum, I really like using with pigs on pasture because it will really soak up a lot of that nitrogen and phosphorus that the pigs put down. And you'll have, I mean, we've, we've put the cow herd into paddocks of both of those annuals plus, plus pasture. Um, where the forage sorghum is eight to 10 feet tall. Yeah, the, the cow herd just kind of disappears in there. And uh, the, the one paddock to me that was really extraordinary, you kind of have to have everything right for it to work properly when you're doing broadcast seeding behind pigs that you got to have some soil mo moisture so they can trample it into the ground and all that. Um, but we ran our cow herd, which was, um, you know, probably like 55, 60, um, you know, big cows plus maybe a dozen or two of calves. So I think we put it at like 75 units equivalent. Um, they grazed a paddock that was two thirds of an acre for 36 hours. That was this pearl millet and forage sorghum. So the, the biomass that was there was, was quite extraordinary. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. No, you don't, you don't hear of that happening very often when you broadcast, I'm assuming you, you broadcast a few days before the pigs come out. Yeah. And do they eat some of that seed that you put down, especially some of those bigger seeds or. If, leave them alone? So yeah, kind of what we figured out is that if the seed is smaller than a sunflower seed, the, the pigs are going to get a negligible amount of it. You know, I'm sure they're getting something, but, but not much. Um, they, they will smell it, though, and they will definitely want to go after it. So obviously, by doing that, we're, we're using the pigs as a soil uh, disturbance tool and then as a planting tool by either snuffling it with their noses into the soil or just trampling it in. Um, so we don't ever want to use treated seed. You know, that would not be <laughs> that, that grand. Um, and I, I forget exactly what your question was, Becky, there, but... Um, no, you, you answered. Oh, so it's yeah, yeah. It's one, one to three days prior to the to the pigs moving um, is when we seed it. You just want to make sure the pigs have left before the seed germinates, because if they turn that germinated seed over, then it then it dies, and uh, you just wasted your money out there. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and one last question, real fast, and I'll be done. Yeah. I'll, I'll shut up too. Um, <laughs> when have you found any? Um, plants that come back in your pastures through this disturbance that were not there before? Like, are these pigs turning up seeds that were in the seed bank that hmm. were maybe natives of years in the past or just uh, seeds that were plants that you hadn't seen before? Just out of curiosity. Right. Yeah. I mean, you, you certainly get stuff that you're like, what is that? Um, you know, we get some like bluegrass that will come back that, you know, you're not normally seeing. Um unless it's intentionally planted uh one weed it, it's a weed but uh i don't call it a weed because everybody loves to graze it is um carpet weed i forget what its its technical name is but it's kind of a, a wiry shorter type of plant that has you know like a smaller type of leaf on it maybe like a, a honeysuckle type of of leaf but it's called carpet weed because on exposed soil particularly in shaded areas it likes to just completely carpet the entire area and um, you know cows love to graze that in the summer the pigs have, love it they they tear it up so if you just look up carpet weed it'll pull up what what it actually is um, you know and then of course by disturbing the soil with pigs you get plants that you're not necessarily thrilled about um, you know like spiny amaranth is always going to be around if you have pigs and uh, that was something a couple of years ago, I was at a conference with Ray Archuleta and I talked to him about it. I was like, hey, what do we do about this spiny amaranth? Because it's, it's really 
uh, it's a something you got to kind of tolerate and, and deal with. And like with many things, it's probably more of an aesthetic issue that we as people don't like to look at it and be like, oh, look at all that amaranth out there. Um, what we found, though, is you can you can control graze amaranth with cattle. Um, that if you can bring them in when it is flowering, they will eat the flowers off. And if you bring pigs back in when it's in seed stage, they will eat the seeds off of it. So you can you can try to do that. His recommendation was, hey, the, the amaranth is really just the soil telling you that it's nutrient overloaded, that there's too much nutrients going on. So he was like, make make hay off of that field and feed it somewhere else for a couple of years, you know, extract those nutrients back out of that soil and put it somewhere else. Um, so that was effective in reducing the amaranth load. And what we found to be uh, very effective is timing when we have pigs on that pasture. So we try not to graze pigs on the pasture from like May to August uh, because that's when the amaranth will come on. Amaranth loves exposed soil and it loves lots of nitrogen and phosphorus. And that's exactly what pigs are gonna do for you. So uh, if we can limit the amount of feeder pigs that we have on the pasture from kind of that May to August timeframe, that really um, suppresses the amaranth because it does not compete well when it's shaded out, you know, as, as a germinating plant. Great, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Sounds, yeah, the weeds, I know, everyone has their own thoughts on weeds. Um, there's still some weeds out there though. So that I consider weeds <laughs> cows and yeah. don't like, so it's always good right. to hear other people's um, take on it and how they've been able to over overcome it without using the typical tools that, uh, right. that are offered these days. So. Yeah. Okay. One that seems to thrive in our pig civil pastures is Perella. Mm. Um, you know, that will come up a lot and we will have a very dense crop of that in late summer. Uh, which is actually kind of cool when you put the pigs back in because they graze it down and, you know, the whole hog range is going to smell like mint, like, a, you know, a mint essential oil for a, for a day or two as they're knocking all that down. So, you know, what we found is most weeds, if, if you have a, a good crop of the desirable uh, or palatable species of grasses and forbs in the pasture, the animals are not going to eat the poisonous ones until you push them so hard that they, then they do because they're they're hungry or, or whatever. So the you know the occasional uh, you know moonflowers and amaranth that comes along hasn't been an issue as far as like an animal toxicity thing for us because we're keeping the cattle there for one or two days. They're eating the good forages and then we're moving them on, you know, and then bringing the pigs back in to knock around the other stuff. Um, so that, that's kind of our approach is work with the animals, let the animals be our, our uh, instruments as much as possible. And then do make those managerial adjustments on things like, all right, well, we're not going to do pigs during, you know, May to August on the pastures if we can, if we can help it um, to help keep down something like amaranth, or we are going to mow hay on that field, bale it up and feed it somewhere else to kind of balance out the nutrient, um, you know, load between different areas. So, Usually it's when we have this attitude of we need to fix the problem right now that a lot of machines and chemicals get involved. But if we have more of the approach of, all right, well, we're going to adjust what we're doing over a two to three year time period and you know, see what the results of that are and kind of implement that into our management decision making. That's when it's a lot easier to, to have a kind of a continual uh, uh, success of what's going on as opposed to just spraying and mowing all the time. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I like sometimes the, the fastest approach is not always the best approach. And uh, sometimes you, we as farmers need to be patient because we are in that natural resource management realm where patience definitely is a part of the job that we, we have. So yeah, yeah. But, yeah. The, the chemicals and machinery can, uh, can make a lot of bad management decisions look good so yeah we need patience and we need it now that's right that's right <laughs> well jordan uh thank you so much for your time tonight uh it's a little it's a little past seven here but i uh, really appreciate you jumping on with all of us and 
and sharing your a little bit about your story and, and giving us a, a lot of information to mull over in our head. And I wrote down a couple pages of notes here myself. So thank you so much for what you do as a farmer here in Virginia. I always, you know, farmers, being a farmer is not easy. It takes a lot of grit and perseverance and stamina and um, just some sometimes some stubbornness. And so really appreciate the uh, the style of farming that you're doing and hope that you continue and are successful in your uh, adventures going forth. So thank you so much for your time. Um, I thank everyone else. There's some clapping hands there. Thank you uh, for Jordan. Thanks and a lot, Jordan. Thanks, Peggy.